And uh, we have today with us Dr. Siobhan McLanica, who worked with Tina in completing her PhD in school. She's now working in research with the Irish Universities Association. And the title of Siobhan's talk is Input and Experience in Minority Language Acquisition, New Approaches, Novel Methods, and the Value of the Irish Case Study. Thank you, Siobhan. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all very much for coming to this seminar. Um, what I want to talk to you today uh, about is the research that I conducted here in UCD as part of my doctoral thesis with Tina and with funding from Coral Gemensch Squel to Cthulhu Squel Scalipta and Scarmark Pole, a Sucks Adventure. Um, actually, it's nearly a year to the day that I did my Viva in this room, <laughs> so uh, still very fresh in my memory. <laughs> um, but um, just a, a, as a little note on the, the significance of the title, when I use the word experience, what I'm talking about is the language experience in terms of the exposure the children get and the input that they get, but also, as you'll see from some of my data, it's looking at even a bigger picture than that of the experience of being an Irish speaker, how you acquired your language and how that has an impact on how you use the language. So I'm using experience in a little bit of an unorthodox way in kind of psycholinguistics and merging with sociolinguistics. So um, but nobody's taken issue with it, so I should have just skimmed over that and it would have been fine. Um, so there's a couple of different components that I want to talk about as part of this seminar, and time permitting, we'll go through all of them. Um, the first part is I want to look at the acquisition of a complex aspect of the Irish language. This is really the main thrust of the thesis, and that was looking at grammatical gender acquisition, which is a very complicated piece of the Irish language. So looking at the acquisition of that, um, one of the key things that emerged from that was the impact of intergenerational transmission and the impact of adult and the influence of adult input. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, that led us on to look at and to try and listen to the voices of the speakers. So we looked at new speakers and native speakers, and I'll explain who they are um, and how, how their voices can tell us about this experience that I talked about. And then time permitting, I'll look at a the acquisition of a more simple or a more readily accessible part of the language, which is the vocabulary, age-appropriate vocabulary, and looking at it more from the perspective of the school as an input environment, and shifting that away from the home, which is more the, the previous part. So, um, I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody in this room, but just as a very quick reminder, Irish or Gaelga um, is a threatened language that's spoken in the Republic of Ireland, it's the first national language, but English continues to be the more dominant language. Irish is spoken mainly in um, officially designated areas known as Gaeltach areas on the um, northern, western and southern seaboards. So you can see that the green dots represent Gaeltach areas according to boundaries set out in the 1980s. Um, no, these are more recent actually, these are in the mid-2000s. And you can see that there are green dots in the middle, kind of midlands, and so, but the, the main ones are the northwest and southern Gaelic. Um, but just so that's about 77,000 people who are using it daily outside the education system, but there's also another 438,000 who use it in the education system. So they're by no means to be kind of forgotten about that they are Irish speakers and they are part of this overall picture. Extensive cross linguistic research has pointed to the um, children's sensitivity about input factors and how the input that children hear has an impact on the output that they produce. But this is even more so the case for minority languages because of the number of domains that they hear the language, the people, the types of people that they hear use the language are more restricted for a minority language like Irish than they are for a majority language like English. So studies by Parody and Cochon and others like that have found that this is particularly the case for those who speak minority languages. And they have found that even to complicate things even further, usually with minority languages or quite often it's being acquired bilingually alongside another minority language or a majority language, so that exacerbates this issue of input even further because we have to think about the time to get input being shared with one language or another language. So um, I want to introduce this concept of a critical mass of input and just to mention that this is Dan Sloven and um, he is the, the regarded as one of the main um, thinkers behind the cross-linguistic approach and looking at languages other than the majority of languages like English to tell us about how language is acquired. Um, but so the 
the, re the reason that um, Dan Slogan has been kind of critical of some studies lately is because there has been no differentiation of the study participants according to language background. And so there's been no consideration of who the people are, but also how they've acquired their language and what input they've received to be able to acquire their language. Um, and studies by people like Gathercole and Gathercole and Thomas have addressed this issue, and what they've been finding is a consistent lag between monolinguals and bilinguals in acquisition, but they attributed this to a reduced daily exposure. It's mathematical that bilinguals are having to share their time in acquiring two languages, and that while there is a lag being seen of, in bilinguals, that that's not really a true reflection on their language acquisition. It's that they're having to hear input in two languages to acquire them successfully. And what Gathercole talked about was the need for a critical mass of input to extract the necessary formal abstract uh, to get that synthesis of items in order for them to be able to go from a piecemeal item by item approach to language acquisition to being able to extract rules and to make sense of the grammatical structures of their language so that they need a critical mass of language in order to be able to construct the language and that's um, a kind of the constructivist theory of language acquisition and more in keeping with the views of Thomasello and Carmelo Smith who I'm going to mention in a moment then maybe some of the theories about Chomsky that you might be familiar with. So Carmelo Smith looked in particular about acquisition after the age of five and what she found was that she found um, incomplete mastery of certain forms or structures even in middle childhood so even into kind of beyond the age of five which is when we think that you know, most languages acquired, it's not, that acquisition goes on into middle and into late childhood, and that she found that this was particularly due to the variability and transparency of formal and reliable cues and form function mapping. And form function mapping is the, um, how a particular function of the language, or what it's used to mark, is actually enacted in form in the language. So if this is complicated, then it'll take more time for children to acquire it, and therefore acquisition may continue into middle childhood. So, um, so the, the way that Irish is particularly complicated in this aspect of grammatical gender is, um, I'm going to explain it to you now. So grammatical gender is marked in language, so it's um, the form in language is by applying the H or the lenition to the initial phoneme of a word in a number of different contexts. So you might be familiar with this as the shaving. So one of the contexts that it's used in is to mark grammatical gender after the definite article. So the definite article in Irish is un. So un followed by a feminine noun that would be marked from grammatical gender. So by adding the H, you denote that to be a feminine word. So it become un a uh, becomes uninyuk. But cha is a masculine noun, so that stays as un cha. And in the case of noun adjective combinations, when a, an adjective follows a feminine noun, that also has to be marked. So there's another layer of complexity there that on yog war, whereas you have cha and bon, it says on cha bon. But then to complicate matters even further, when you have the context of third person possession, that rule flips. So what was now a masculine unmarked default, and the feminine was always the noun that was marked it's turned on its head. So in the case of third-person possession, masculine nouns are marked for third-person possession. Whereby if you were talking about Sean's coat, you would say a cota, whereas if you were talking about Maura and her coat, you would say a cota. So even if a child is kind of getting their head around this idea of masculine and feminine, which is a, a, a big concept in and of itself, that they have to get their heads around that there's, it's used in some ways in these contexts and then it's used differently in third-person possession. So the first part of the research that myself and Tina did was looking at this acquisition of grammatical gender and we ex explored the impact of differences in the home language experience and age on children's language acquisition. So the home, langu the home language experience was the kind of the key component of that and we were looking at children being raised in different types of homes and what impact that had on their language acquisition. So just to remind you that the Irish language community is under pressure from the majority language English and given this opaque grammatical gender system being acquired a high state, being acquired alongside a high status language like English, we were expecting that grammatical gender would be an interesting pressure point at which to examine the nuts and bolts of the acquisition of grammatical gender in Irish but also the kind of bigger picture of what it's like when you're acquiring a complex piece 
of the minority language in the context of the majority language acquisition going on as well. So we developed a number of measures. We had to develop a number of measures for the research because these measures don't tend to exist for um, minority languages. So one of the measures that we developed was the measure of Irish morphosyntax, and this was um, based somewhat on a similar measure developed by Gather Colin Thomas in Welsh, and it had three subtests which measured or tested the children's um, accuracy in marking grammatical gender in those three contexts that I mentioned already. So following the um, the definite article on in noun, adjective, combinations, and in marking third person possession. Um, and we developed another couple of measures as well, like we developed a measure of receptive um, understanding of these things rather than using it in production, but I'm not going to get into that today because you're going to see it later. Ooh, surprise. <laughs> so, the children that we recruited for this study, we had 308 children altogether, and they were recruited from homes in which Irish was the dominant language, where, uh, in, from homes in which the parents spoke both languages, and then from homes in which English was the dominant language. And what I mean by dominant is that, it, you know, that Irish was the main language of the home, maybe with some English, and that English was the main language of the home, but maybe with some Irish, depending on where they lived or the schools that they went to. <coughs> and the age groups were 6 to 9 and 10 to 13. So you can see that while they were more or less balanced, even still, even though we really targeted the children from the Irish dominant homes, so much so that I was driving for hours into the belt of that, even still, the English dominant homes, even with that targeted approach, they were still that little bit more kind of prevalent. So um, it just goes to show, even in the belt of the areas, that the English dominant home is still the more not the, the more typical language background. So. Um, looking first at so the use of grammatical gender in production, so the test required that children say out loud and mark these things out loud. So what I did was I took those items which required something be done to them, that the grammatical gender be marked, and I looked at how they did that according to the standard of what you're expected to do in that situation. And we can see here that overall there's very low levels of accuracy in any of the subtests. So they um, along the the graph is graphing percentage correct. So we can see that it's very low. I mean, even if we look at grammatical gender following the definite article and a noun adjective combinations, noun adjective combinations, they basically don't do it. So they don't mark grammatical gender, regardless of whether it's masculine, feminine, regardless of the adjective, they don't tend to do this. Um, but the context of third person possession, it was a bit of a different picture. So we can see in this context, first of all, the obvious is that they were more grammatically accurate in this context than in any of the other contexts. But it's also the context where we see the most variability between the language background groups. In the other two contexts, regardless of how the children, what the language use patterns in the home were, they were more or less the same. Whereas in this case, the group that is that bit higher than the rest of them are the Irish dominant homes. And a regression analysis did find that language background predicted the most variability in, or the most variance in that context. Um, have I, yes, sorry, I have got that. So, um, given that there was some difference in that context of third person possession, we looked at that a little bit further, and we found that the variance accounted for was 39.5% of the variance, um, with a um, significant model, and that. The, mo the child language background, age, and performance on subtests one and two of the measure of Irish morphosyntax syntax predicted the most um, variance. So basically what that means is that the child language background predicted the most, so whether a child was being raised with Irish in the home, Irish in English, or English, predicted the most variance. Oddly, age was slightly significant, but the younger children were older, were bit more grammatically accurate than the older. I've yet to come up with a, a, an explanation of that, so I'm not quite sure what went on there. But I think it was interesting that both of the other subtests of the measure of Irish morphosyntax syntax were significant here because while their accuracy was quite low, it still predicted that if you could understand it in one context, that that lent itself to understanding another context. So I think that's interesting in itself. Um, so. Um, just to sum that up then, in relative terms, the children who had the most Irish input in the home were the ones who were most grammatically accurate. But if we look at it in absolute terms, really the accuracy was still very low. So just to remind you, these are children up until the age of 13. These are kids who are about to enter into secondary school. And they, they 
So while they might have a good grasp of it, and it's some, some grasp of it in some contexts, like third person possession, it just doesn't seem to be something that they're doing in um, non-agile combinations or following the definite article. So that got us thinking about the kind of the, this idea of language background in the home and how that has an impact on language acquisition. And so we looked at intergenerational transmission and the influence of adult input. Um, so intergenerational transmission in the home is basically that the language has been passed on generation to generation. It's been under pressure in the Gaelic for some decades. I mean, it's been since um, Hindley published a book in 1990 talking about how this has been under pressure and more recent studies um, by people like O'Hifernot in 2008 and in this collection of, story, of stories from parents, Hogan Merle Gaelic and by Brian O'Brien found the same thing and in um, a paper that Tina and I have written about some of the results of this it was also coming out the same that many Gaelic parents are opting to speak English to their children and there's many reasons for this but one of them is that they want their children to be bilingual so they speak Irish and English to them in the home which is a very you know kind of in some respects well informed and they want them to have the benefits of bilingualism but that what they're missing is the further information that when you're talking about a mi minority language you need to bolster that as much as you can so that speaking Irish in the home is good because they will acquire bilingualism just by virtue of being in Ireland. Um, so, but to note outside of the Gaeltacht, the number of um, speakers who are acquiring Irish as a second language is increasing because of things like the popularity of Gaeltacht, of um, Colossi Saura, of other kind of youth clubs and summer camps and the um, prestige that's associated with Irish as being seen on Tichy Cahar and things like that, that, that they have led to an increase in the vitality of Irish outside of the Gaeltacht, which is being seen alongside pressure on the language in the Gaeltacht. So um, what I did was I wanted to look at, look at the data that I just talked about, but from more of a taking the language background alongside looking at age and looking at language change across the generations. And um, so I took those data that I just reported on the 308 children and their, how they did on the measure of Irish morphosyntax, syntax and I did the same test, I used the same measure with a sample of adult speakers. So 135 participants altogether, 42 of whom had been raised in the Gaeltacht, so the most of them had been raised outside the Gaeltacht, and then broke them up also into their language background groups. So I broke them up according to home generated Irish dominant, school generated highly proficient and school generated bilinguals are moderately proficient and that's based on self-report that they said that they rated themselves either very proficient in, in the language or moderately. So I wanted to see how that interacted with it. Um, oh yeah and just to note that the age groups in this case were the under 25 year olds the 25 to 55 and the 56 plus and those age ranges were chosen so as to reflect as much as possible the kind of the typical ages of non-parents people who would be parents of children of in the age group that we looked at and then the people who most likely have children who are older or not aren't in that age group we didn't kind of control for that very strictly but that was the general gist of it so um the first plot here looks at that first context of subtest one, the um, noun gender following the definite article. And what I think is interesting here is that while we're seeing a gradual increase in accuracy over the age groups, really there's a pretty significant break between the kids who are 13, so there's the teenagers in between there that we haven't got any data on, but it still seems like even the youngest adults are doing something quite significantly more accurate than the kids are doing. Um, and you can see as well that the group that was always, and this was consistent across all of the contexts, was that the adults, the older adults, were always the most accurate. So it's the over 55s who were the most accurate, then they were, then the 25 to 55 year olds were less accurate, and then the under 25 year olds were the least accurate and also had the widest, as you can see here, had the widest spread of scores. Um, so that this seems to suggest that even if children are acquiring this slowly, there definitely is still a break there, that they're not doing it in kind of a, a slower but normal trajectory of development, that it doesn't seem that that, that jump 
is very significant there. So by the age of kind of 13, when you would be expecting that these things would be kind of developed on a normal trajectory, that's not the case. And then this is, we've, we've seen these data already, but they, they, in the context of lenition and nanagent combinations, the kids just aren't doing it. And we can see that the adults are doing it to a to some degree, but I think this actually even is a might over represent how much the adults were doing it, and that over 55 year olds were doing it with a fairly high level of accuracy. But that these under 25 year olds, the, the spread of scores is very wide, and you're still only talking, I mean, that's still percentage correct. So even those under 25 year olds are still only 42% correct. So it's still, you know, relatively, we're seeing an increase, but in absolute terms, again, it's actually still quite a low level of them, um, and that wouldn't be regarded as kind of full mastery of that component of the language. Sean, do you think you have two breaks there? there? Do you think you have a break for your children to your under-trained and then your under-trained mm -hmm. Yeah. They're beautiful plants. There's something called a, a, a tree method of statistics, which will actually do breaks for you, which would be wonderful, yeah. I think, because they're formally breaking for you. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Good to know. Um, but then just the last one then is in the context of surplus and possession. And we see here that the, the, the picture changes here. So third person possession does seem to be a context that is different from the other two. In that, if you see while the 10 to 13 year olds weren't kind of as a group approaching the adult levels, there was still this kind of smattering of kids who are whose accuracy was at the same level as the 25 to 55 year old. So we are seeing something that is some, a kind of a comparison there, or a, um, a likeness there between the children progressing on to the level that the adults are using, or the type, not, not even the level, but just the, the, the norms of language use that the children's language does seem to be, or the, um, the child participants seem to be using the language in a similar way to the adults, which wasn't seen in the other two contexts. So it's not even about grammatical accuracy as some sort of a kind of measure that it's just, it's looking at the language use norms. So um, the, one of the, the, the kind of key findings of this was this thing about clinician being used. And even though it is something that's being used by adults, and particularly those over 25, the use of it does seem to be decreasing as you go kind of younger down the generations. And even though children should be hearing some of it in the language they hear around them, they're not using it, at least up until the age of 13. They're not doing this in their kind of, um, in their language. And then, so it is possible that this is something that's becoming a marker of the literate educated speaker, because the only explanation for how you could jump from not using it at all in your teenage, in your early teenagers, to using it to some degree in your late teens into early twenties, is that it's being target, it's a targeted thing in schools, and that it is becoming a marker of the standard language that's taught in the Gaelskola and the Gaelkloshti, whereas in the Gaelic schools they're going along with the native varieties and however people are speaking their language that that's accepted and it's not targeted in that same way. So it's possible that it's becoming a marker of a literate and educated speaker. Um, but um, before, just to, to mention one more thing and I'll come back to this again, but the, uh, um, the, the really interesting finding I think for me from that study is that the things that the adults are doing most accurately, you know, so if we go back to that third person possession, the things that the adults are doing most in their speech is marking third person possession, more so than they are marking it after the definite article or non agile combinations. And we see then that the impact that that has on the children is that they are marking it, maybe not quite grammatically accurately yet, but they're definitely doing something more with this component, it's definitely something that they're hearing in their speech and they're thinking, okay, I need to do, I need to do something with There's something going on here that sometimes mom says, I hope that, and sometimes she says, I hope that, and I need to figure out what's going on here, much more so than in the other context. That if the adults aren't giving the children that exposure to a component, then that's not something that they're acquiring. In context where they are hearing something of it, it's giving them something there, it's giving them fuel to figure out what it is and to figure out that system. So, um, the native and new speaker voices, this is one of my favourite pieces of the research that we did 
and it's published in the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism. So I, act, I like I know I'm just shooting my own trumpet here, but I actually do recommend reading it because it's a, it's a really interesting kind of because it's voices. Voices are always interesting to read, no matter what your own background is. So what I will say, just to give a, a brief run through of some of the key points of it, and um, when I talk about new speakers. New speaker is a term that's emerged from the sociolinguistic research, and um, it's if we look at O'Rourke and Walsh's definition, they talk about a speaker who learns the language outside of the home, and it's spoken with fluency, regularity, and commitment. And commitment is a, a key word there as well. And this is new speakers are seen in Welsh, in Scots Gaelic, in Catalan, Basque, a lot of minority languages that were previously that the numbers of speakers were falling over the you know, over the generations that new speakers are kind of taking this language, learning it in school or outside of the home, and then speaking it with fluency, regularity and commitment. And I think actually it's interesting, only this week, though, um, the Ma Michael D presented an award, I think, to, um, or uh, it was a recognition of the translators of Irish who were working for Duolingo and how there's something like 2.3 million people worldwide who are now learning Irish and most of them aren't in Ireland. So these are people who are taking this language and, and making it something different and making it their own. So I, it, I just find this um, particularly fascinating. But so, um, and this, the reason that it is so interesting sociolinguistically and psycholinguistically is because the, uh, the declining numbers of native speakers in conjunction with the, the new speakers is that for issues around ownership and authority. So when we think about native speakers, they're often reified and held up as champions of the authentic or of the authoritative form of the language. And in this case, this kind of notion of authenticity being tied up with the language coming from a place and from a particular people and the speakers being bound to that, to that geo geographical area, whereas the new speaker movement, if you like, is turning that on its head really and it's taking it uh, taking that geographical component and turning you know turning that around um, but it also has an impact on how we think about language ownership and how we think about what constitutes correct use of the language and who gets to say whether something is correct or incorrect in the language um, so I conducted interviews with um, native speakers and new speakers here in UCD. Um, there were seven young adult native speakers and ten young adult new speakers, and all of the native speakers were raised in the Gaeltacht. So again, that was kind of a crude, but people tended to fall into that group of that. When I looked for native speakers, they were all raised in the Gaeltacht, and then the new speakers, all of them had learned the language in school. Some to a, a a little bit might have had a little bit of it in the home that a parent did speak the language, but they wasn't spoken as the home language. Um, and their current home use for the native speakers ranged quite widely at the moment, as or at the time of doing the interviews. So it ranged between 20 and 100%. Um, and then for the new speakers, their current use of Irish had quite a broad range as well. Some of them were saying they don't really use it anymore. Others were saying they use it at every opportunity and they're studying with their friends, with their family when they can. Um, so, they, and then just to say that the recruitment was done in Irish, the interviews were all done in Irish, they were, it was offered, um, they could be done in Irish or English, one person did the interview in English, but the rest did them through Irish, one new speaker. So, um, some of the native speakers, so the native speakers are in green, some of them um, voiced these opinions around, or the views that the native speaker variety is preferable, it's the more kind of natural um, way of speaking and that it's preferable to the language that they hear and that they hear and um, that people who learn it in school speak. So you know I'm not criticizing people who learn their Irish from books in school but I think that naturalness is very important because it is the flavor, the character that the language has. And a similar view was, was voiced by some of the new speakers where they talked about things like I'd be thinking I'm not able to express myself as well as I can in English, I don't know the slang and the Irish spoken in Connemara is the perfect note so that they see the native speaker Irish as being the, the more preferable because of that naturalness and kind of that idea of authenticity. However, that authenticity doesn't guarantee authority 
which is what, what I was talking about, that it's shaking this notion of that if you have authenticity, then you get authority, that it, that doesn't seem to be the case. So the authenticity doesn't guarantee authority. And the intercommunity experience reported by some native speakers was that they had had their type of Irish that they speak criticised or that they were told that they weren't using the correct words. Um, so when you're young and you get words from your parents and then you go to class and they are wrong. And I've have come across people since this who tell me that this is their experience with their kids in school or their, that of their friends. Um, my grammar is not as it could be, especially here in university, with everyone who are studying Irish, they have everything perfect. So it's seen that while they might have the naturalness, that it's not, it's not a highly regarded version of the language because the people who have it from school have everything perfect. Um, and it might, be, might use words that are more correct in terms of the standard language rather than the native speaker varieties. And then, so the reason that I wanted to, to kind of bring in this side of the study is that when we were talking earlier was about the accuracy of the, um, what a group that contained both native speakers and new speakers and how they actually did when you gave them kind of a test of their grammatical accuracy, how well they did. And um, actually in, mo in all cases, I'm sorry, I should have actually showed you some of the data. In all cases, there was the... L2 speakers, the second language speakers who were highly proficient, who had acquired their Irish in school, they always came out of being the more grammatically accurate across all of the contexts. And the um, adults, so ranging from kind of this age group of the student age group up until older, but that the adults, they, those who had Irish in the home, those who would have called themselves native speakers, were typically the lowest in terms of grammatical accuracy. Not not always in the difference between them and the moderately proficient speakers, um, L2 speakers kind of changed a little bit, but in every case, those who had acquired their Irish in school and who reckoned that they were quite highly proficient, they were always the ones who came through as being the most grammatically accurate across all contexts. So just bearing that in mind, when we think about what they actually said about their accuracy, um, there was this, this kind of... Um, idea that your attitude is more important than your accuracy came up across native speakers and new speakers. And so like what the new speaker said, we have Irish now and we're communicating without being fluent, without having native speakers, it's like it'll do. Uh, I'd say if you have a love of the language and you don't care if the person has accurate grammar, I'd say the thing is they are speaking Irish and they are trying to speak Irish. So this seems to suggest a kind of a very all-inclusive, you know, accepting everybody for the way that they speak but it might actually show more of the native speakers' lack of confidence around their own Irish and the competition that they see between them and the, those who are learning it as a, as a subject in school, but who are learning it as something that's much more kind of prestigious in that it's associated with the standard language and much more correct. So while it might seem that they're being kind of all-inclusive and trying to engage all types of speakers, there is some of that and there is some of the lack of confidence in their own, in their own proficiency. Um, and this was voiced by one speaker who said, because they really, we, Gaelic people, this is a native speaker, don't have good grammar because they don't learn it in school. I'm afraid to write things and ask my father to correct nearly everything I write. And if I'm right in thinking, I think that was a native speaker who was studying Irish in university. So even still, she's still very lacking in confidence about her own accuracy and would ask dad to correct things. Um, so they, and then, um, yeah, so and again, in terms of the kind of pedagogical approach, some of the teachers took it that we knew the rules and then for the rest, it was more important that they developed the dialect. We have rules that are not in the standard and wouldn't be right according to proper grammar. So it's differences in pedagogical approach of wanting to kind of keep that traditional dialect of the area, but that this then kind of goes against the standard language that's tested in state examinations. Um, so bearing that in mind and what the new speakers said, that they, the new speakers seemed to kind of agree in a sense in that they were saying that the style and the natural rhythm they have and the rich vocabulary of the native speakers, that that is the most important thing. Um, and that the native speakers, they want everyone to have accurate Irish. So there, see, there seemed to be kind of this 
idea among some of the new speakers that it was the native speakers who were saying that they should be doing everything right and they should have accurate Irish and that everybody can't be higgledy-piggledy in how they use the language. So it seems that there is this kind of misunderstanding or misrepresentation of each other's views between the new speakers and the native speakers. And these were all students who were in college in UCD who would be mixing with each other anyway. And um, that they had differing opinions of you know, their, what the other thought. Um, and then, sorry, I knew I had this in here somewhere. This was the, um, the data on when we look at those adult data, but if we look at it from the perspective of language background rather than age, age is there as well, never mind. Um, but we can see here that it is the, this top line here that is quite above everybody else is the school generated highly proficient. So they're up on 80% accuracy um, in the context of marking after the definite article. And um, whereas the other, I mean, it's just, just to highlight that you're talking about the native speakers and the speakers who said that they had acquired the language in school and didn't rate themselves as being particularly proficient were performing in similar ways on the, the grammatical gender test. So it's just very interesting that this, this lack of confidence that the native speakers have is borne out in their opinions and in their thoughts, but also in their actual performance on the test. So just as a, a really quick summary, the new speakers raise very interesting questions about language authenticity, ownership, legitimacy and authority and that we have to be very careful in how we look at revitalization efforts and things like that, that it's not about preserving a notion of what the language should be or was in some previous time that nobody really remembers but it did happen, or is it the case that we need to think more flexibly about what language is and how it's a, a communication method for people and it is what it is, but it's about having balance of not being static in this notion of what the language should be, but also bearing in mind, I mean, research that Tina has done and others that have looked at and have shown kind of concern about how complete an how complete the acquisition of languages um, and others like Montreal, um, in, uh, who's looked at Spanish acquisition um, by um, heritage speakers, and it's looking at that idea of having a complete enough acquisition that it is functional and that it that you have to be able to use the language and make sense of it. So you want to keep that, some of that in mind and also be flexible about what constitutes the, the, the Irish language and how we use it. And then very briefly, um, I'll just say a quick word about um, this last component. So what we did was we looked at uh, the acquisition of parts of the language that is more easily acquired, which is the age appropriate vocabulary, which you would expect kids in this age group to have and looked at it from the perspective of the school as a um, language acquisition environment. So just to mention that Oregon in 1997 talked about how Irish is unusual among endangered languages and having significant state support. So Irish is a, I'm sure you know, is a required subject on the Leaving Cert for people who don't have an exemption. So that by doing that, it meant that the schools were able to continue to produce a small but committed percentage of bilinguals and that the maintenance and that this maintained um, the small minority of Irish speakers and without them this would have they, the revitalization of the continuation of Irish would have failed. But it's interesting that he says small but committed because like I mentioned there's 438,000 people studying Irish as a subject in school but not all of them go on to acquire the language to uh, in, in a way that they can feel that they can use and don't use it outside of the education system. So, um, and then just to, I won't belabor this because I'm sure you all know this, but um, the Irish is a required subject from school entry. Most kids start school and studying it at around six, but some of them do attend Neonry before this, so that's the Irish preschool. Um, and there's three types of Irish language education. So the main one is Irish as a subject in English medium schools. And then there are two types of Irish medium schooling. That is in uh, Gwyllthorpe schools. And the reason that that's debatable is because the um, a policy published last month about um, Gwyllthorpe education, their figures, their up, most up-to-date figures said that about 76% of schools are using Irish as the language of the school that are located in the Gwyllthorpe and that officially are supposed to be using Irish as the language of the school. 
and then Irish medium immersion education um, is the, the other model. Um, kids in Gaeltacht schools, even though they're in the Gaeltacht and the school is supposed to be Irish, you know, primarily Irish medium, those who have been raised as native speakers with Irish as their first language at home tend to be in the minority, even in these Gaeltacht classrooms. And that um, research again by Tina has found that they, in some schools they don't tend to be seen as the priority because they're seen as having good Irish already and that the priority is getting the Irish of those who aren't acquiring it in the home kind of up and that there's a bit of neglect then of the needs of the children for whom Irish is their first language. And then they're, even for kids who for whom Irish is their first language, they're also in the minority in the immersion classrooms. They tend to be um, children who are being raised with English or another language in the home and who are acquiring Irish as their second or third language. Um, so we used the Trial Gaelic Drum Conrock, the Vonskull and the Gaelic Douglas Long Gaelic as the measure of Irish reading vocabulary and the Drum Conrock primary reading test reviled as the measure of English reading vocabulary and these are um, measures that have been normed in Ireland. So we had a couple of different school types. Um, there, most of them were Gaeltacht schools that were category A, so that's in the kind of stronghold of Gaeltacht. But then we also had a case study of the immersion school and the Gaeltacht in category C. Their schools kind of on the outskirts of the Gaeltacht, so they wouldn't be in areas as strong as um, when you really go back. Um, and then just to say very quickly that in the Irish reading vocabulary, um, a, we ran a regression and the 62.3% of the variance was accounted for and included in the variables that accounted for that variance was school model. And this was also the case for the English reading vocabulary. So here the model predicted 43.6% of the total variance and school model was also a significant variable here. So the type of school attended by the child, whether it was the um, school in the kind of the heartland of the Goethe whether it was the school outside of that that used mainly English or whether it's the immersion school that this did have an impact. Sorry, I'm going to try and rush through because I want to spend a minute talking about the conclusions. So the main conclusion and the, the really point that I wanted, that I always seek to make in relation to that particular study is that while I didn't have an awful lot of time to go into it, take my word for it, the children in the Irish, the children who were using Irish in their classroom be it in an immersion school or in a Gaelic school, acquired a good level of Irish, and you know, an age-appropriate level of vocabulary in Irish, and also an age-appropriate level of vocabulary in English. Whereas the kids who were in learning Irish as a subject in school and had English in the home, had English that, that you would expect of that age, but their Irish wasn't at that level. So even though the kids, for particular the kids in the immersion school, even though they had English in the home and they were only getting Irish in school, they were still acquiring an age-appropriate vocabulary when you look at native speakers of Irish. So school model can have an impact and can lead to additive bilingualism where one language is added on to the other without a detriment to the first language with the necessary support and enrichment. So that brings us to the overall kind of conclusion of the thesis, which was that the end point towards which children's acquisition is progressing is in a state of flux. And there's one way that we can look at the outcome of what I just presented, and we can talk about it in terms of language death. And we can talk about it that it confirms language death, and this is the kind of approach that some researchers have taken in recent years, and that they see it as the kids aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, and therefore they're doing it wrong, and this is the harbinger of language death. Or the alternative that I can see is that it highlights the importance of input and the need to have targeted teaching to address speakers' needs, given how dynamic these language outcomes are, that we need to stop talking about children not doing it right. We need to look at what the adults are doing. We say the adults aren't, the adults are making up their own rules in some cases, or doing it with a, a not entirely 100% level of grammatical accuracy. So why in the world then would we expect the children to be acquiring a complex system you know, perfect grammatical accuracy when they're not being exposed to that in the language that they hear. Um, and just to mention in terms of policy and good news that was published in that stood in the policy document that was released by the Department of Education and Skills last month was that the um, policy recognises the need to focus on supporting appropriate Irish medium education provision for children and young people who are being raised with Irish 
and they also say that in order for a school to gain recognition and resources, um, as a Gaelic school, they will have to focus particular attention on the differentiated language needs of native Irish speakers as well as learners of Irish. So this is very positive that there is that recognition and the targeting of the needs of the children for whom Irish is their first language. And it's also good to see the differentiation and the, the recognition of the impact that school model and school approaches can have on language acquisition. Um, yeah, so very final point. Um, in terms of um, the recommendations made in the thesis alongside kind of issues of policy, um, the turning from the school context and looking back to that home language context, um, one of the key things that kind of that we recommended was promoting family language planning. Um, as I mentioned, so there's some examples of where it's been done at the moment. As I mentioned, um, particularly with that publication of the book by Brian O'Brien, Hogan Rilly Gaelgi, parents talked about how they wanted their children to be bilingual, so this is what they were doing, but they need more information about the context of the minority language and more support in that in, in that endeavour to continue speaking a minority language because um, as one of the papers in the book talked about that you become a de facto language activist when you try and raise kids with and it, the spoiler alert that was my dad who wrote that piece and he talks about how he became a de facto language activist because he was trying to raise me and my brothers with Irish in the home and the battle started in trying to get my birth cert in Irish you know so that's but by giving parents that support to create an enriched language background environment in the home um, that would be very positive and this is being done by um, in a couple of places with the multilingual early language transmission and the um, growth truth in Wales. I always say that wrong so I know that's why Tina's looking. <laughs> um, and then just to really hammer home that last point about how we need to recognise the shifting sociolinguistic and psycholinguistic context and reduce the emphasis on the deficit model. So this ongoing narrative of what the kids are doing is wrong and that they are not, that the language that they are using is, it's been described as everything from um, broken Irish to, the, now that the, there's a, a group who are now talking about how the Irish of kids being raised with Irish in the home as their first language in the Gaelic are second language speakers, that they're just not acquiring native speaker Irish. So I just don't, I don't agree with that way of looking and I think we need more understanding of the needs of children acquiring a minority language as a specific con context and not a deficit model that undermines the needs and values of L1 acquisition of a minority language. Grammy Lamaki. Thank you. Um, um, I'm trying to take a few questions from you. I very comments. much would like to take questions. There's uh, papers that are either published or to be published soon or a soon-ish, so. Gentlemen, um, say someone growing up as a native speaker in the Gales, do you get much exposure to written Irish? Because I was thinking there's this discrepancy between language use and then language grammar, perfection and grammar, which they seem to be that lacking. Would a typical child growing up in the Gales would they be reading Irish books, story books at home, and stuff like that? Um, it, it depends, I suppose, it, yeah, it depends, but also that is something that is being targeted in recent years by publishers and that there is more, uh, um, Game of Thrones was published in Irish a couple of weeks ago, Harry Potter, even at Harry Potter, Escoelga. so there is a recognition of the need for that, that not just published literacy, literacy materials in Irish, but engaging and age appropriate and, you know, comics, Escoelga and things like that, that are engaging particularly for teenagers that they continue to get that kind of, um, to, to get exposure to the written Irish, but in a way that brings it outside of the classroom and outside of school materials to wanting to read for pleasure. And that's been recognized in, even just in terms of the, the, the availability of those books. It's nothing like what you get in English, but it is, uh, it is increasing. I mean, that would seem to be really kind of important because most of the time when we're using language, any language, we're just kind of chatting. We may, may not be perfectly grammatical in what we're kind of saying, mm -hmm. but um, just kind of being the average child of growth when we get up home. Do they start reading like Harry Potter in English when we're 11 and saying as everyone else does? You know, the, the grammatical aspect would seem to be in some ways possibly and to be dependent a little bit on literature as well. Yeah, as and that's an advantage that kids in the Goyle School and then the Goyle Colossi seem to have as well. They're being given this exposure to um, 
kind of texts that are designed to help them notice. I mean, Tina, them, the research that yourself and Nancy developed that it was tar- to, to target children to notice there's a H there, there's a there's isn't there, you know, and to, to, to get them noticing why that this happens and then starting to understand how it is that they go about doing this themselves or to understand the, the, the system of it um, and that that isn't... There isn't as much of an emphasis on that in the Gaelic like schools because it's more about kind of, like some of those speakers mentioned, kind of um, maintaining the, the native dialect and the importance of that in the Gaelic. Like, whereas it would seem to me that it's that kind of targeted pedagogical input that the kids in the Gaelic school and the Gaelic class are getting that leads us then to see that they are the ones who are excelling on these tests. And that has, I mean, even when you think about how that's tested in the Leaving Cert. That has a knock-on effect on the confidence and, um, you know, people's kind of a sense of authority that the language that they're speaking is, you know, acceptable or correct. Because they even with things like state exams, the kids for whom Irish is their first language don't actually breeze through them as easily as some people. You know, the oral exam might be fine, but that the written exam isn't by any means a breeze because they're not, they're not kind of exposed to it in that way. I don't know, team. Do you want to? No, 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 the literacy levels are so low. The rates of leisure reading in the States are very low. And I mean, so the books are coming now where it's kind of like you've lost loads of generations of people who just weren't doing anything. Well, I'm sorry, you know, I was just going to add just the idea of losing generations, and I feel like. Anytime I rant about my own Irish education, people remind me that it's, it's no longer that way. And that uh, I'm just wondering if to, to see the, the output of, of this sort of work is going to be down the road. And I expect if you're successful, there will be a dip, but also then an increase in yeah. just use of Irish. But there's a bit of an investment in, in waiting for, for that. Mm-hmm. I'm just You'd hope so. And I mean, from what I've heard and from what I've heard of teacher teacher friends of mine and people who've been through it a little bit more recently than, you know, we have sorry Brent. But uh, that that it has it has changed that it, that they I, and I think that has a lot to do with just the approach to how everything is taught in schools as well as differentiated learning and it's very experiential and, and touching and dancing and all these nice things that um but I think yeah, you'd hope then that that'll have an impact down the line be it either that the general pedagogical approaches or you would hope that things like the policy and graduate education would have an impact down the line as well, that there is recognition of the needs of different types of needs. And I'm not at that by no means saying that it's any one group is more important than the other. It's just that you have to recognise that they have different needs and that they need to be met in different ways. And I'm sure Paul, yourself and Maureen are busy in COG <laughs> on foot of their well, report. Told, well, I told this so you sort of we're central to the next 20 years of Irish language progress and we've told them now give us the, the, the people that we need to do that and we'll do it. But um, sort of because, uh, if, if you want to listen this morning to, I think it was, um, it was one of the, uh, was it just before I ended up, I think there was an interview with um, Donald Mahanathan, who's a chairperson of um, COG, uh, talking to Roman and Parish about so, sort of the things that we have to do. But there was also a piece from Anani Character yesterday. Uh, there was the Pashtu Gaelic and the Erythus, the, 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 one of those places where people sit together and put questions, and Anani Character with a very forceful and very sort of um, uh, a lot of questions about well, this is great what we got now but these are the things we have to do to make sure that they work and uh, it, 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 it'll, be, it'll be on that program this morning imagine the girl had that and she sort of pointed out but the, as you said the parents need to know and they need to know before all these things are implemented Mm-hmm. They need to be informed about all of the, the benefits and all the other things of the, the, what they're doing, and sort of things. Um, but, but also, they need to know that sort of they're going to be supported. Mm-hmm. The teachers will need to know what, what is going to be done and how it's going to be implemented. And a lot of it's supposed to happen in 2017, so <laughs> <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what happens. Cool. Just a question that 
not directly related to your data, but you might have some views on it. The question of, of authority or authenticity. Um, in my school, when I was learning Irish, we had mostly teachers in Munster Irish. So I've always found it difficult to understand dialects that are not Munster, particularly um, Connacht Irish and some Munster Irish. So the question is, is there a difference among native speakers or among non-native speakers in their perception of which dialect is the most authentic? And the second question is, what about intelligibility of dialects? Because sometimes I turn on the news and I find it extremely difficult to understand the news in Irish because of the dialect in which it's spoken. And that's a pity, but that's just my own limitation. I, I only wish I had more time to go through the qualitative data because they are some of the things that were discussed by the speakers. Um, everybody reckoned that their own dialect was the best dialect. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> you know? um, and with the, I suppose, the um, controversial point being that Dublin speak, speakers who learn their Irish in school and, you know, and speak it with other people from Dublin or from outside of the Gaelic area is that the contentious issue is that they would see what they speak as being a legitimate new dialect of Irish and that there's tension there between whether that kind of stands up against the old you know, hard hitters of the three kind of very well established dialects. And in terms of the intelligibility, yeah, they did talk about that. The poor um, Donegal Irish always gets the uh, always gets the worst of it. Nobody, everybody reckons they could understand. It appears that the native speakers in the dialects I find least difficult, least easy to understand, are speaking much faster, uh, with no gaps between what they're saying, and it just becomes a blur to me. And I'm sure people. <laughs> In other dialects, maybe Tina, you can like, navigate all of them. But I wonder, is that just the incomprehension? You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, I, I do know that I remember hearing an interview on um, on TV when Tina, Tina G started, where native speakers were saying in Connemara, were saying that they had very little exposure to Ulster Irish until radio and was <laughs> So that even for, you know, between the dialect groups, the native speakers who had the most capacity didn't have that much exposure. Yeah. So some of it does seem to be about just increasing people's exposure yeah. to get um, comfort. If I if I played you a Glaswegian speaking, you'd probably have trouble with that in English. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. that is, yeah. <laughs> but it is that unfamiliarity, I guess. It's and that's cool. what made this the group that I did the interviews with so interesting was because they're all third level students from all parts of the country, you know, from the range of um, Gaelicity, all in Dublin and all interacting with each other in the common Gaelic or, you know, the common Dramic or whatever. And uh, one girl, a couple of them mentioned particularly, there was two speakers, I think, from who spoke the North, uh, the Donegal dialect. And I'm nearly certain that both of them mentioned that since coming to UCD that they kind of toned down mm -hmm. the accent and toned down the dialect and that they'd acquired new words from other speakers that, but then the bizarre thing is when they go home and try and use those words with their family or friends at home, they're told, you know, kind of, who do you think you are? What, you know, what are you doing coming in here using, you know, and they find it difficult then to speak comfortably with grandparents or with parents who are saying, what's that word? And I don't understand what you're saying or, you know, talk properly. So well, it, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's a lot in it, and that's that's I think the value of the Irish case study is that so much of it is so big picture stuff that has it. You know, it it doesn't matter whether it's Irish or English or any language, and um, and it's a lot of it is to do with people's place and people where they feel comfortable and who they feel comfortable with and where they feel confident and authoritative. So it has kind of implications for much more than you know, that this particular context. And I just thought it was very interesting and sad in a way that, that you know, this kind of mixing and everything was, they didn't complain about it, of course, but just that it did have that impact on that they were saying that they kind of toned down or that they didn't use words or that they picked up other words. And it just, uh, that's that's just the, 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 the nature of it, I suppose, when you have groups mixing, that that's just a, that's a, a general social psychology of just that that's what happened. Can, can I make just a point that it relates to what you're saying about the embarrassed of Irish? It relates to the same speaker in three different contexts. 
Seamus O'Brien in, in his book, um, Seo Cara, describes when he was uh, employed as a chimera uh, uh, in the ground of the country to speak Irish, and everywhere he went, they would say, they would say, you can also be Irish, you look at the Oscars, we can understand you, and he went to another place, and he went to another place. He finally went back to Ulster, and somebody said to him, we only have Ulster Irish, and they didn't understand why. The second thing was, he once said about the Irish people, he said, Ulster Irish and Irish are the same thing. He once said about the Irish people, he said, the best Irish in Ireland is spoken in Donegal, the best Irish in Donegal is spoken in Ranafast, the best Irish in Ranafast is spoken in T. Eleni, that was his father's house, and the best speaker of Irish in T. Eleni is me. <laughs> and the third point was, he eventually looked in Dublin, he helped work on the, 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 some of the dictionaries. One evening, one of his uh, their children or one of the neighbor's children came in. They had a, an exercise to do for the following morning. He wrote the exercise for the child. The following evening it came back and it was covered in red marks. Now this is a man who wrote at least 5,000 pages in total, maybe with a good over 40 years, and yet he was being corrected. You <laughs> It just it kind of shows sort of like it encapsulates a lot of sort of those kind of um, and so much of it is to do with questions of power that are so much bigger than any of this anyway. So um, I would recommend that you uh, read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> what is this minority language ownership? You need to do more. You need to do more listening. Minority ownership. Okay. So any further final comments or questions that all people have things to do at two o'clock? So I'd like to thank you all for a very enlightening. Very enlightening.